Just think about the first time you heard that song. Assuming that this is not the first time you heard that song. Most of you heard it a long time ago. And, and as the song goes along, you know, this is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. There's a growing sense of disorientation. Uh, there's this, that sense of feeling unsettled without really knowing the cause of that feeling of being unsettled. But there's also some, something very funny about it. Um, and that, you could almost say, sums up maybe what we call Kafka-esque, um, all of those qualities. Uh, Franz Kafka died 100 years ago. Uh, for that reason, we're you know interested in him now. But the truth is, he kind of never goes out of fashion. Um, uh, he's got something to say to pretty much every generational cohort, including right now, Generation Z and Millennials. I always feel like he's like the perfect guy for Gen X, but I don't really see a lot of Gen X Kafka things going on right now. But one of the places that uh, Kafka is very hot is on TikTok, where many people stand Franz. Uh, and... Uh, this is according to LitHub. Kafka, uh, this, this LitHub is quoting from a, a few people. Kafka is my bare minimum, and I won't date a man until he is Kafka, wrote one young TikToker. Uh, knowing that Kafka died thinking he was a failure, wanting for all of his work to be burned hurts me more than anything, wrote another. We are going to have one of the people who really is making Kafka re-famous, sort of, uh, on TikTok. Maybe the person, the best-known person for doing that. Uh, that is Margaret Muka, a content creator, a creative executive. Her TikTok handle is AquariusCat444. Uh, she has made many TikToks uh, about Franz Kafka, and she's joining us now. Hi, Margaret. Hi, nice to meet you, everyone. <laughs> well, we're very happy to meet you, too. So maybe talk about how these feelings towards Franz Kafka arose in you. What was the, the trigger point for that? Okay, so I first read his book, The Metamorphosis, without thinking that I would really like it because, you know, it has a bug as a cover, so I didn't really think much of it. But when I read it, I just related so much with the main character, Gregor. And it just changed my life after that. Kafka is definitely my third author. And the reason I related with Gregor, the main character of uh, The Metamorphosis, is because uh, basically he got, he got transformed into a bug and his first har hardest task was to get out of bed. And I think that so many people my age can relate to that. And I've been there as well. Um, and in general, like uh, the main character felt very alienated in society because he wasn't accepted. He wasn't uh, looking in a certain way or he wasn't living life in a certain way. So, you know, his family abandoned him and he just died. So I, I think that it's very relevant to a lot of people my age. You know, it's also I'm going to come back to this again and again over the course of today's show. It, it's also funny. Um, and, and actually, I think one of Gregor's, I haven't read it in a while, but I think one of Gregor's early thoughts after realizing he's been transformed into a huge bug is that he's going to be late for work, um, which is maybe not most, maybe that is most people's uh, first thought. Yeah. But there is, you know, it, it's when you, the more you know about Kafka, the m harder it is in some ways to understand why he would be funny. But I, I don't know. I assume that you find him at least somewhat funny too. Yeah, I mean, it is funny, but then at the same time, like it has a lot of depth behind it. But I think definitely a lot of people can relate to that. Um, uh, you know, like it's very hard having to go to a work that is not fulfilling necessarily. And I think that Kafka talked about these issues a lot. Like he found his actual real life job very monotonous and, and he wanted to just have time to write. But, you know. Uh, he had to work. And I think so many of us relate to that. We have to just work all day and then commute to work and cook and just live to work. And we don't have that much time to actually pursue what actually makes us happy. So definitely. So the, there's another part of uh, Kafka, which is that of the somewhat thwarted romantic man. Uh, his love letters are of great interest. Um, there, are, there are love letters to different sets of so kind of potential, potential fiancés. Um, and I know that's one of the things that you're celebrating a little bit uh, in the TikTok as well. Say a little bit uh, about how Franz Kafka's heart seems to you, the way that he expresses love. Um, I think that 
For example, uh, his letters to Milena, they were they are the most popular ones. Uh, but as you said, he had many other uh, love interests. I think that Kafka views love in a more of an intellectual way and made more platonic because he only saw Milena a couple times in real life. And I think they both had other partners at the time. So it was definitely more of an intellectual, um, long distance type of relationship. So I don't think he was... He, he wasn't that traditional in the way he was experiencing love, I guess. But definitely, he loved her a lot. He wrote so many letters to her. But I still think that it was more platonic. Like, he he just definitely... Um, sorry, I don't know what else to say. Well, no, you, I think you've summed it up very well. We should also say the letters to Felice are, are also... Um, um, maybe a slightly different kind of relationship and, and one where you feel Kafka's almost neurotic need for her all the time. I'd like to point out the rock band The Cure has a song called A Letter to Elise, which is clearly a nod to letters to Felice. So, well, let me ask the, the other question, because, I mean, terms like heartthrob are starting to pop up, at least in the coverage of the TikTok and, and, and Instagram and other social media celebrations of Kafka. I don't know. Is Kafka hot? Um, I I wouldn't really say that myself, but yeah, I do think that it's a big trend. I, I just think that people feel a bit disconnected. So seeing him write love letters and express love in that way really makes people want that because we don't really have that in our generation easily. But I wouldn't personally consider him hot in that way. But yeah, it's definitely a trend where people from uh, like the Gen Z generation just find him attractive, maybe because he was a bit um, just strange as a person. So <laughs> definitely I, I can understand why some people find, find him attractive in some ways, but I wouldn't say that. He's kind of ambivalent about everything, including his own writing. Um, and that attitude continues up to the point of his death. Uh, he specifies to his literary executor, his very good friend, and also kind of a stan as well, Max Brode, uh, that he wants all the remaining stuff burned. Um, and, and he doesn't really, I mean, a lot of what we think of right now is his oeuvre was in fact pub published posthum posthumously. Um, like like other writers, like Melville, uh, I, I don't think Kafka was all that well known. Not not the way he is now at the time. And I know there is something incredibly tragic about that too. This this man who now is really kind of regarded as you know, Auden said that he was to the to his century what uh, what Dante uh, and Shakespeare and Goethe were to their centuries. Um, so here's here's this towering person who has no idea. I think Margaret that he's towering. Yeah, I think that that is the the most interesting and the best part about Kafka. He, I mean, it's sad for him, but, you know, he just died thinking that um, he's useless and that he's not talented and that his work is not that influential. And it's really interesting to see that he was actually very ahead of his time and that the everything that he explored uh, with his writings is very relevant to today. Uh, you know, he talked about mental health issues. He talked about his weird relationship with his father. And I think these were taboo topics back then and not that appreciated. And I think just it's just a great example for people to not be that self-critical and to put themselves out there and be a bit more confident because also in his love life and in just every aspect of his life, he was very insecure and self-critical. So I definitely think that... Um, Yes, he wasn't recognized back then as much as he should have, but I think that it's the perfect timing for this to happen right now. So, Well, Margaret Mucha, uh, Margaret Mucha, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing uh, your love for Franz Kafka, your platonic love for Franz Kafka, uh, content creator <laughs> and creative executive, busy person. Her TikTok handle, once again, is AquariusCat444. You can see some of this Kafka stuff there. Uh, Margaret, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. And let's transition over now to our other guest in this segment. Uh, Carolina Watroba is postdoctoral research fellow in modern languages at Oxford's All Souls College and the author, um, and it's, I think, pretty recently out, of Metamorphoses in Search of Franz Kafka. Benjamin Balin, who's been with us before, is author of Kafka's Last Trial, among other books. Uh, his new book is Bruno Schultz, An Artist, A Murder, 
and the hijacking of history. So I think maybe I'm just going to begin by asking each of you, starting with you, Carolina, just to maybe react to what you heard there, what you heard from Margaret. Uh, I know that you've been traveling all over the world, finding all the residences uh, that Kafka seems to have in in all kinds of different societies uh, and locales. Uh, But what did you hear in what Margaret said? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I actually first came across Kafka on TikTok when I was writing the book um, because um, another woman of a similar age got in touch with me to interview me for her student newspaper about how Kafka is trending on TikTok. Um, and, you know, at first I didn't really know what this was about, but then I had a look and um, I thought it was really interesting. And um, what's so interesting about it to me is that in some ways, it, I think it really gets Kafka, but in other ways, it actually, certain ambiguities about Kafka are lost in interesting ways in this in this wave of uh, fascination on TikTok. So um, Kafka is a perfect lover, for example, that is quite a paradoxical um, <laughs> Kafka that we see there because the letters are incredibly touching and poignant, but also some parts of the letters that he wrote to his fiancés are actually incredibly, you know, possessive, almost um, obsessive. And really those letters were one of the best things about um, having an affair with Kafka because otherwise he was very scared of commitment. Um, um, None of his engagements uh, led to a marriage he was really afraid of a bourgeois marriage so it was quite interesting to see him as this cast as this perfect lover but then in other ways yeah i think it does capture something about this enduring fascination and about the sort of phenomenon of this of this um funny man from prague who still keeps speaking to people a hundred years later yes by the way those the letters to felice are just kind of weirdly needy, you know, and, and kind mm-hmm. of over instructive about how often yeah, she quite. needs how often she needs to write to him and, and in what uh, tone. But so Benjamin Balent, um, yeah, I mean say whatever you want about what we've heard so far. Although I think one of the interesting questions to explore is is any particular time in modernity particularly Kafka esque, or has has life been kind of Kafka-esque since the Austro-Hungarian Empire at minimum? <laughs> we just kind of notice it from time to time as the decades unfurl. But but go over, wherever you want with all this. Well, thanks, Colin. And I think uh, let me begin by saying that uh, Kafka was not just ambivalent towards commitment, <laughs> as Carolina quite rightly says, but I think even more largely towards belonging. And that what that's what makes him... I think speak to us today. I think his writing was really born of the impossibility of belonging. He sort of pulled away from the from the temptations and the invitations of belonging, whether that belonging was represented in matrimony, whether that belonging was represented in something collective or national. Um, you know the famous uh, <clears throat> the famous line that he delivers where he said, uh, "What do I have in common with the Jews? I have hardly anything in common with myself." Mm. Yeah, I mean, and if we could just stay with that ambivalence for a second there, too. I think, you know, it's it's there also just in his attitude towards his own work and towards having his work published. I think at some point he says something like, I am roughly equally as happy to have my work returned to me by a publisher as I am to have the work published by a publisher. Um, the entire time, this entire life, it seems, Benjamin, like he's even struggling with that. Is it good to be a writer? Is it good to be me as a writer? Is it good to have my work published? Is it good to have people see these things that I've written? It's, it's a question that doesn't ever really seem to quite resolve. That's absolutely right. And that's why, uh, as you mentioned, it's really Max Broad, his best friend and literary executor, who is responsible for creating the Kafka myth that endures a century after Kafka's death, that endures to this day. Um, You know, Max Broad wasn't just the uh, literary champion who, who pressed Kafka into sending his works to publisher, but as you mentioned, you know, Kafka left all three of his novels unfinished at his death. It was Max Broad who painstakingly edited them, gave them order, brought them brought them to us. 
um, decided not just to betray Kafka's last wish, but to do the very opposite, to publish everything, including not just the fictions, but the the love letters, as mentioned, including you know, Kafka's letters to his father, including his diaries, a recent retranslation of which was just was just uh, issued by Ross Benjamin, which I highly recommend. So, um, you know, here's this this incredible act of betrayal as rescue. You know, in a sense, Max Broad had to rescue Kafka from himself, and that's I think when you know when we speak of of an author or uh, as someone who speaks to us. Um, I think what we mean in part is that we feel that they understand us even when we don't quite understand ourselves. And that's personally how I feel when I read when I read Kafka's uh, works as well as Kafka's diaries and letters. So, um, Carolina, I, I may be forcing a resemblance where it doesn't really belong, but, you know, we think about TikTok and it's, it's a very, very short form. And when we think about Kafka, I think most people do think uh, maybe about the three not entirely completed novels and about the metamorphosis, which we can call it a novella or a long short story or, or whatever. But an awful lot of Kafka's works are these very enigmatic short things. They're either prose poems or diary entries that seem to be more morphing into something more than that, uh, or or just, you know, we now have a term, the short, short story, the incredibly short, short story. Um, I'll actually read one to you, and then I just want to, it's one that you'll know very well, obviously, but, but uh, uh, and I think this is a Ross Benjamin translation of it, too. Uh, it's often referred to as wish to become an Indian. If only one were an Indian, ready right away, and on the running horse, a slant in the air, briefly shaking again and again over the shaking ground, until one dropped the spurs, for there were no spurs, until one cast off the reins, for there were no reins, and one could hardly see the land ahead as a smoothly cropped heath, now without the horse's head, neck and head. Um, that's the whole thing. I don't know what that is, whether it's a story or a prose poem, but it's kind of interesting, Carolina. I mean, he worked a lot in these very, very short forms. Yes, he was very much the master of the short form, although I'm not sure that he would have described himself um, as such because he was often very frustrated about not being able to to finish writing. Um, one of the few texts that he was really happy with um, throughout his life was a story called The Judgment, which mm -hmm. he managed to write in one night, starting at 10 p.m. and finishing at 6 a.m. And it was this sort of enthusiastic spurt of creativity. So it's almost as though he can really only write what you can write in one sitting. But what you just read out, which which is a fragment that I really love, is is even much, much shorter than that. It's, it's really just a few lines. Um, and it Interestingly, the this little fragment itself is about sort of disappearing or realizing that something that you think is there is actually not quite there, or actually fantasizing about something being there, not quite being there. It's it's so enigmatic and um sort of evocative. Um and clearly the extreme brevity of this fragment about disappearance is is part of its charm and closely connected to that absence um at the heart of this little text so um kafka really does um excel at writing those you know one sentence um just a little note and and as you say it is extremely difficult to even draw any boundaries around those sort of little literary gems because as you hinted they often grow out of his diary, of a notebook that he keeps. He will sometimes start writing something and never finish. Um, sometimes he will try a few times, a few different versions of, of a little sentence. He is clearly always thinking about those sort of evocative little fragments or shards. Um, and even if he is quite frustrated at not being quite able to build them up to big novels, I think over time, we collectively really developed quite a taste for this kind of writing. <laughs> yes, I, I would agree. Yeah, no, I mean, sometimes with the, di the di diary entries will start as what appears to be a diary entry, and then halfway through it, he'll say, and I am so short and so fat. And he was actually tall and had a lot of trouble keeping weight on at all. And you suddenly realize, oh, this isn't a diary entry anymore. anymore. He's writing in, in some other voice. Um, 
You know, I want to talk about that idea of Kafkaesque, uh, Benjamin, and uh, that's a thing that you know it has a lot of different components to it. But but as it as it is embodied by the trial, it is I think about people trying to navigate some kind of system that they don't understand. It's like Durkheim's definition of anomi. There are rules that you can't see that you don't know. They don't make any sense. There's no logic to them, and and. I do feel as though that never goes away. And even the idea of being held on a charge that is never explained to you never goes away. I mean, as we watched what unfolded in Guantanamo uh, after 9-11, the U.S., this kind of paragon supposedly of of freedoms uh, and of rule by law, started holding prisoners with, without any charges. Maybe say a little bit about that, that there is almost a kind of permanence to the sense of injustice is the wrong word, but kind of an illogical uh, systems that purport to deliver justice. Right. I think the, when somebody like you quoted W.H. Auden about <clears throat> how Kafka encapsulates the 20th, 20th century, I think it has to do, of course, with the angst, the ambiguities, the bafflement in the face of bureaucratic uh, forces. In that sense, uh, Kafka, in his very deceptively simple style, manages to confer confer all of that. Um, I think, you know, despite his clairvoyance about this impersonal cruelty of the bureaucratic state and the, uh, the alienation of contemporary life that he that he talks about. Really, I mean, the astonishing thing for me is Kafka could never have foreseen how many admirers, including TikTokers, would both read and um, misread uh, his his fictions after his death and, and how many people would seek to appropriate him for their own um, for their own purposes. And, uh, you know, there was, of course, the existentialist Kafka um, that that pro sort of propelled the Kafka craze of the 1960s. Uh, there's the psychoanalytic Kafka, who people who read uh, Kafka's stories like uh, a hunger artist as, you know, n neurotic heralds of uh, the self-tortured, uncanny poets. Um, and Kafka, of course, was pulled into this or that political cause. Um, and I, I'll just, you know, relate an anecdote if I if I could about um, how he was he was used and and, and why um, his name was was turned into this adjectival cliche that you mentioned the Kafkaesque um, is that there was this uh, in 1956 when when the Soviet tanks were crushing the Hungarian uprising. Uh, a Marxist literary critic by the name of Georgi Lukács was arrested in Budapest, and he was sent to this um, castle in in Romania. He was not told the um, the charges against him, much less offered the right to rebut them. And his line at the end of all of this was, "Oh, so Kafka was a realist after all." <laughs> yeah, I mean. Um... Uh, we've been missing Russell Benjamin here. I, I heard him tell a story. I make the observation. There's a the podcast serial is done in its most recent season about Guantanamo, uh, and there's one episode where this man who's been arrested for kind of not much at all, not anything that really would they would be able to make a case about. He's been arrested, held in Guantanamo, but eventually his interrogators go on his honeymoon with him. He gets married. And they go on his honeymoon with him to Lake Tahoe uh, and, and they get the government to pay for it. And it's just, he said, you know, that level of absurdity is also part of Kafka. You know, that that this horrible, absolutely unjustifiable thing would happen to you for no sen sensible reason whatsoever. But then maybe some, something kind of funny would happen uh, after that as well. Uh, we're going to take, take a quick break here. We're going to come back. Uh, we want to hear first from Carolina, who's been also looking at how uh, Kafka is under Understood and, and enjoyed in places like Korea and uh, other Asian nations, and much more besides. So stay with us.
If I was listening. So we're talking about Kafka. I'll explain in a second why I'm playing that song. Uh, but with us is uh, Carolina Watroba, a postdoctoral research fellow in modern languages at Oxford's All Souls College and the author of Metamorphoses in Search of Franz Kafka. Benjamin Balin is author of Kafka's Last Trial, among other books. His new book is Bruno Schultz, an artist, a murder, uh, and the hijacking of history. Um, before we get to Korea and things like that, uh, since we just played that song, Carolina, um, Kafka kind of famously was freaked out by telephones. Uh, and it's there in the castle. It's there in a short story called My Neighbor. Uh, obviously, you know, a fairly new technology. I clearly didn't like it. But part of the story of Kafka is somebody who is experiencing maybe the kind of early surges of, we th- of what we think of as modern technology. He is going through that technological revolution. It may touch him in his uh, private life. It definitely t- touches him in his professional life where he is working in a pretty high-ranking job eventually at an insurance company. But I mean, maybe just talk a little bit about Kafka and technology, taking us all the way from his fear of the telephone to his, his presence on TikTok. Um, Yes, so Kafka had this fearful fascination with new technologies. So yes, they freaked him out, but also he constantly wanted to hear about them. And here his letters to um, Felix Bauer, one of his fiancés, are very instructive because she actually, one of the things that clearly were the most attractive about her to him was that she worked in a company in Berlin, which uh, produced um, sort of audio instruments, audio equipment um, called a parlograph, which was like an early dictaphone. And he was um, often asking her about, you know, for the details of the new designs. And she ended up being sort of like the marketing executive at her company. And that really fascinated him. And he would come up with these sort of little funny predictions for the future. He was imagining what it would be like if her parlograph from Berlin connected with his telephone in Prague and how they could have a conversation without the the two humans actually having to participate at all. Um, So he, you know, so there you have this sort of classic Kafka humor, um, but also some sort of anxiety about technology replacing human connection, but also actually clearly some attraction to this possibility that um, technology could replace humans, since Kafka was often so awkward about in-person interactions, especially with with women. So um, that's something that he experienced in his life, and then, then it makes its way to his writing. And in particular, his um, one, one of his novels, which is the one that probably people have not heard about as much, um, which is called America, or The Man Who Disappeared, depending on the translation. This is a novel set in the United States, which Kafka had obviously never visited, um, but he read some contemporary accounts of the United States, and part of what fascinated him about the US was this rise of modern technology. And that novel is absolutely chock full with you know, automated desks and complicated systems connecting multiple, just dozens of telephones. And the main character is always sort of intrigued by all of these different mechanisms and actually decides he would like to become an engineer, which he can never quite achieve in the novel. So this has led to Kafka being in many ways seen as not just a prophet of totalitarianism, as, as, as Benjamin um, was explaining earlier, but also specifically this this technology fueled dystopian state. Um, that's how he is often talked about today in discussions about AI and um, you know Chat GPT and the mm-hmm. rise of um, those modern technologies. So Benjamin, you know, I think another thing that can get, kind of get a little bit lost, but I think it's, it's interesting and important. Um, you know, Kafka is alive and working in an office at a time when maybe the office culture, the office experience, which has kind of overspread life globally since then is, is maybe in some of its earlier stages. Uh, and, and he's, he's got this pretty important job eventually at this insurance company. Uh, he's senior legal secretary of the workman's accident insurance Institute for the kingdom of Bohemia in Prague, hard to say in one breath. Um, and actually Princeton university press recently, uh, a few years ago, collected all of his, a lot of his work, writings about workmen's compensation and workplace safety and um, even letters arguing for a salary adjustment uh, in his favor. favor. But you get the feeling that doing this 
and and learning about and having to understand bureaucracy and technology and the safety of spa elevators in Marion Bad or you know new automobile safety and stuff it, it's it's probably not unimportant right i mean in a way being in a somewhat alienating office environment also grounded him a lot in, in the life a lot of people have wound up living yeah that's absolutely right and i think you know <clears throat> this this points to um the duality of our own view of kafka biographical and his works right in the sense that on the one hand Kafka was a was a person who needed solitude. Uh, he once told his friend Max Broad, "What I have to do, I can only do alone." On the other hand, as you mentioned in his novels and his stories, he is profoundly registering the um, convulsions of um, of his time of the twentieth century, but also of our entry into this new bureaucratic kind of modern way of of living and there's a deep antinomy there that all biographers of Kafka and by the way Max Brod was the first biographer in 1937 have to contend with at some time is you know um how do we how do we reconcile the uh Kafka of the imagination of the literary imagination with the biographical factual factual Kafka there's there's very deep mysteries there and um, there's a great struggle to reconcile those two realms that 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 give his literary expression such um, such acuteness and such and such pu and such purity. But it's it's precisely that paradox that we have to understand um, when we talk about Kafka's own ambivalence and and his wavering sense of self. All right, so I'm going to play the when we decided we were going to do this show, and it's really kind of our second episode about Kafka. Uh, the one thing that I insisted on playing is actually a clip from another show. Uh, we've done, you know, more than 2,000 episodes, <laughs> I think. This might be my favorite moment in the history of this show. Irene Papoulis, who's a, a scholar and writer and a regular guest on our show, was on an episode in 2016 about losing and, and feeling like a loser. And somehow or other, she got on to this particular tangent. This is B2. We're going to play B2 right now, Control Room. <laughs> I, I've heard about that imposter syndrome, but I sort of feel like I've, I've often had the opposite. I hate to say it, but like, so the feeling of like, if only people really knew me, they would recognize right. me, but I can't be recognized in the world for whatever reason, you know? So that's the, 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 you know, the, the person who's afraid to speak, you know, but just thinking like, if I could just speak, then I would be, I would have a great life, but I'm just, you know, and so that's why I identify with Gregor Samsa, you know, the, <laughs> the Kafka character in Metamorphosis, you know, he wakes up, he's a bug. He has this whole inner life where he's thinking these things, he's listening he listens to someone playing a violin and he just like has this, he's moved. He's like, he has all this like rich inner life, but he, no one can hear him. He tries to talk and all they hear is gibberish, you know, and they throw slops at him and they think he's disgusting. He tries to come out the door so he can listen to better to the music, but they think he's so hideous that they, you know, he, he has to cower behind the door. That's the kind of loser I can identify with, you know, but that's really different <laughs> from the imposter that loser. That was so great though, what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> it is like I, that's Irene's Match.com ad. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Character I identify the most with, Gregor <laughs> Samsa <laughs> in Metamorphosis. So, Carolina, there is a universality to this story, to the story of the metam of Metamorphosis, which, uh, in some of the more uh, newer translations, is, is the transformation. Uh, there's some debate about what what the right word is to use in English. But I'm assuming as you traveled the world, um, you found that. You know, I mean, a lot of different cultures, maybe all cultures, can identify with some version of what Irene was just talking about there. Yes, definitely. So there is this this um, incredible resonance to this evocative image of a of a person waking up in the body of an insect, and it really seems that across cultures, this is easily intelligible as something very negative. Um, but the, the, the sort of details of what this actually evokes for people, the, the richness of, of how people have read it um, is really quite astounding. So everything from women experiencing motherhood for the first time and feeling like this, this central image from Kafka describes what has happened to their bodies. Um, to um, black people living in a racist society and again feeling that this this image expresses something about their condition to people living under dictatorships or in sort of states under state control that feels that restricts their movement and their freedom of expression 
that really is um, that, 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 that richness um, in the way that this story has resonated for people across time, across language, across culture, is really something quite unique. There's not there's not many writers who have managed to create such an enduring and somehow immediately intelligible um, image. But of course, you know, we, we feel like we know straight away what this is about. But then actually the story is so much more complex that this can sometimes be, um, you know, quite an illusory simplicity. Um, just very quickly here, because we're, we're a little short on time, but, you know, we currently are talking about um, things like K-dramas, uh, which uh, refer to dramas, uh, films coming, films and television coming over from Korea. But K, K can mean two different things, right? Uh, it turns out Kafka and Korea get along pretty well. Just quickly give us kind of a, a sense of that, Carolina. Yeah, so um, when I was working on my book, I um, started noticing that a lot of um, K culture, as as it is known now, coming from Korea, so literature, film, and so on, um, is being sold to readers in the English speaking world as um, somehow, um, especially Kafka esque. Um, and this really interested me, and I wondered if this was just a marketing gimmick or if if there was something more to it. And, and the answer is quite complex, and it has several elements. One of them is that. Korea really is one of the places where Kafka is so widely read, you know, read at school, translated at dozens of times. The castle has been translated into Korean something like 37 times. Um, and really um, all self-respecting writers in Korea will have read, will have been reading Kafka since their teenage years. Um, but at the same time, Kafka there has also become part of the really state-sponsored um, you know, publicity machine trying to raise the legitimacy and the prestige of Korean culture internationally. Um, so it's sort of different forces they're working together to make Kafka so popular in Korea and then to introduce Korean culture to us here as, as Kafka-esque in nature. Benjamin Balin, I've only got about a minute or so left here, but um, just to talk about another um, international experience. You taught Kafka to Palestinian students uh, in East Jerusalem. Talk about how that resonated. Well, uh, I taught the famous parable uh, that Kafka uh, writes called Before the Law, where he talks about um, a supplicant from the countryside seeking admission to the, to the law, uh, who receives this message at the very end of his life that the door before which he has waited in vain, you know, his whole life was intended only for him. And um, I've always loved um, reading and teaching this this parable, uh, but teaching it in, in East Jerusalem to Palestinian undergrads was, was quite an experience and goes back to your first question of today, which was why and how does this work resonate so widely? Um, but to be very brief, you know, I was reading this parable and we were talking about um, how this parable was read by the Iranian writer Sadiq Hedayat. And uh, one of the my students chimed in and she said, why, why are you talking about Iran? It's, uh, this is about an exclusion that's much closer to home. And she said, just before this, this guy from the countryside dies, Kafka writes that he sees a, a radiance which bursts out from behind the door of the law. And my student said, this reminds me of how the word checkpoint got into my life and how not seeing the rest of my country made my eyes lonelier, as she put it. Mm. And we talked about, okay, maybe this is how we can maybe recover the key or a key to Kafka's writing and understanding uh, his writing and, and maybe uh, good literature in general as a kind of radiance that, that beckons for, for, from behind a door that, that is really intended for each of us readers alone. All right. That is breathtaking. Um, we'll stop there. You've both been such wonderful guests, Car Carolina Watroba and Benjamin Balint. Uh, we're going to take a little break, uh, reminding you also it's 100 years since the death of Franz Kafka. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to give you a little bit of the science of bugs that you might turn into and maybe what you should do if you wake up one morning and you are just a big old bug. Coming up.
Some quick thank yous and credits. Uh, Bradley O'Connor is our technical producer today. Uh, watching over everything, ideally, uh, is the Jedi Master himself, Eugene Amatruda. The producer of this episode is the senior producer of the Colin McEnroe Show, Lily Tyson. Uh, joining us now is Tim Coulson, professor of zoology at the University of Oxford. His new book is The Science of Why We Exist, A History of the Universe from the Big Bang to Consciousness. Um <laughs> <laughs> um, Oxford, of course, is one of the most exalted cradles of learning uh, in, in the world, a place of great dignity, which is why Tim recently dressed up as a cockroach uh, to read part of Kafka's The Metamorphosis at an Oxford event. Um, Tim, perhaps you should say a little bit more about why it is you took it upon yourself to dress up as a cockroach. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for having me. So um, in, to celebrate Kafka's life 100 years after his death at Oxford, we had an Oxford Reads Kafka event. And so 26,000 copies of the Metamorphosis were printed and delivered freely to all of the students, the graduate students and the undergraduate students at Oxford. And each of the four bits of the university, the humanities, the social sciences, the sciences and medicine, were asked to run a few Kafka events around the metamorphosis and and i was asked if i'd lead the science side of it because i you know i'm a biologist i'm the head of the biology department and a zoologist and uh part of this was we we, we held various events across the university including discussions about the science of disgust and why insects cause disgust and a discussion about what sort of insect kafka was was thinking about and uh, it culminated in a reading of the metamorphosis in a, a beautiful theatre in Oxford called the Sheldonian Theatre and I was reading a bit of it and I thought why don't I dress up as a cockroach because I knew that the Natural History Museum in Oxford had a cockroach outfit so <laughs> so I did that and um, it, it seemed to go down quite well. <laughs> well I'm sure it did. So we should say that um, just as the word metamorphosis there is a German word that's very close to metamorphosis. It doesn't appear in the text which is why some people have started to refer to the work itself as, tran as the transformation. Instead the word cockroach also does not appear in the text. It just kind of I think Tim where our, our minds differ fault when we think of disgusting insect, insect you wouldn't want to wake up and turn out to have turned into, uh, just cockroaches. We picked cockroach, not Kafka, right? So well, so the German word that, that was used in the metamorphosis was, I, I'm going to probably pronounce this wrongly, but it was ungezeifer, which, which either means insect vermin, or I found one translation, which is unclean beast, not suited for sacrifice. <laughs> um, but, but certainly in, 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 in one of the translations, it's monstrous insect, and, and another one, uh, cockroach has been used. And, uh, you know, cockroach is interesting because actually cockroaches don't metamorphize. They, they grow from little cockroaches and then, um, uh, and then continue to grow to adults. So they don't go through a larval stage like, uh, like many insects, like moths and butterflies. Um, uh, but obviously the metamorphosis was about Kafka turning into this giant insect. And I think people came to um, the conclusion it was a beetle or a cockroach because of the de description of Gregor Sansa waking up and lying in bed and being on his back and having his six legs waving around and struggling to get get onto his front and and certainly in English as well cockroaches I think a little bit unfairly to be honest have a have a fairly bad reputation and do do cause disgust uh, as amongst people particularly you know when there's large outbreaks of them in in unclean kitchens and what have you. Right. And I think you're in saying that, I think Freud might identify this as projection. Uh, cockroaches are disgusting because they thrive in environments that we humans have made somewhat disgusting. It's not that the cockroaches are themselves necessarily doing such disgusting things. When they freak us out, I'm thinking maybe they freak us out because they say something about us. I think that's absolutely right. And in fact, there's, there's um, over 4,500 species of cockroach and only a handful of them associate with with people and and cockroaches have been around for probably the, the sort of oldest fossil and it's a cockroach like animal it's not exactly a cockroach uh, dates back to about 300 million years ago and and certainly by 100 million years ago there were cockroaches around humans haven't been around um you know uh, have only been around for sort of uh, about 300,000 years so Cockroach has got on very well without us, and, and a few species have, have adapted and have evolved to live off our waste um, product. But, you know, there, there are some fantastic cockroaches out there, hissing cockroaches, some some with beautiful colours, uh, you know. Um, so, 
but the ones that we tend to think about, the ones we tend to see, particularly if we live in cities, tends to be what the ones that associate with us and associate with our trash. You know, you mentioned that whole idea of disgust earlier. Um, and, and I do think that if Gregor Samsa had woken up as a squirrel, um, it would have been a very different kind of story. Um, there is something about insects, right? Insects, disgust, we, we're just not comfortable with it. So a lot of, I think a lot of people, I think that's right, a lot of people don't like insects and they don't like spiders and, and, and things like that. And I think it's um, to some extent the way that they move, that a fly buzzing around you can be annoying, that the ones that we often see, the ones that sort of, uh, you know, whether they're flies, house flies or mosquitoes or cockroaches, they're either biting us or they're, you know, they're, they're, they're flying around and, and eating our food, sitting on our food, they'll lay eggs in our food. And I think that's where a lot of the disgust comes from. But but part of it is also the way they move, I think. You know, they, they kind of look alien with their compound dyes often and, uh, you know, the way that flies feed, for example, where they're, they're, they're sort of, you know, uh, kind of digest the food outside and then suck it in. I think all of that, people just think, oh, that's just just not very not very pleasant, is it? <laughs> but there are amazing insects, and insects are incredibly important. We think about bees and the the role that they play in pollination. Um, you know, and, and 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 without things like spiders, we'd be knee deep in insects and flies. So so I think I think it's a bit mean to treat all insects the same. Right. Um, and, you know, obviously when the Anthropocene era ends and we're gone from the earth, they're going to be really relieved. They're gonna, their, their, <laughs> lives are, their lives are going to be way, way easier without us. You know, we've only got about a minute left. And this question doesn't come from me. It comes from Lily Tyson, but it's such a great uh, question. But so uh, the question is, if, you, if I were to wake up as an insect, do you have any advice for me? If I woke up as a, co as a giant cockroach, what, you know, what would be a good thing for me to know as I headed out into the world? Gosh, um, I think if I was you, I would hope to not wake up as a as a giant cockroach, and to 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 wake up as a type of insect that people would be more likely to to like, and and not throw apples at, and not throw slops at, and what have you. I think I think waking up as cockroach was, if he had a choice, it was a bad choice of insect to wake up as. If that, if indeed it wasn't a cockroach that he woke up as. So maybe the, my best bet would be to disguise myself as a bumblebee or something, something kind of fuzzy and nice. Uh, the, I think that's probably right. Something that people uh, would be a little bit bit kinder towards. All right. Tim Coulson, professor of zoology at the University of Oxford. His new book is The Science of Why We why, The Science of Why We Exist, a history of the universe from the Big Bang to consciousness. That may uh, result in another trip back to this show if we can talk you into it. Uh, but let's uh, say goodbye for now anyway. And thanks to all of you. And yeah, read a little Kafka today. It won't hurt you. Sansa, I'll stay near whatever.